smartphones ready? Well, I hope so, because you're in for a real treat. We have got, come on out, producer Mark Nielsen. <laughs> producer Jonas Rivera. Yeah. Director Josh Cooley. Yeah. Christina Hendricks, voice of Gabby Gabby. Yeah. Tim Allen, voice of Buzz Lightyear. Yeah. And Keanu Reeves, voice of Duke Kaboom. Yeah. All right, everybody comfy? Everybody ready? How about you guys? They've been working all morning, and here we go. Here's some more fun. The best part of this whole thing is the new guys, the new women, the new stories, the new characters. It really is the coolest part of this to see this whole family rise up. And I, I said this over and over again. There's a theme park at Disney World based on this movie that we started 25 years ago. And I saw it at a... I knew I saw the, the original Tensor Lamp of uh, Film School done by John Lasseter, and I said I love that computer animation. I saw this done to a terrific story that Pixar came up with back then. I one of these guys. I love that story. I love this story so much about how they get family not family values. I don't want to make it like that. It's just such a warmth of this and this one. Gosh, if you guys haven't seen it, if you have seen it, you see what it is. It's, it's rich and thick and great, and Buzz is so good. Yeah. <laughs> so many emotions. No, she's so lovely. I, I like that, you know, I think when children see this movie, it, 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 you know, she comes across as sort of like the villain at first, and then you, and then you realize that, you know, she, she's coming from a very loving place and I, I think that's important to sort of say like maybe you don't like someone at first but maybe how did they get there and why are they there and understanding their story um, so I think she's very special in that way and then she sort of gets embraced by the, the group and then it's about support and and um, and I honestly thought that it was a joke that they asked me to do. I kept thinking there were like three other people we up for the joke. same you thing said yeah. yes. <laughs> I was awesome. super excited that's awesome. Right. But his transition has always been, okay, that was a terrible moment for me. Let's regroup. And Buzz got to be the same. His core has always been this little authentic, kind of soft-hearted, but no heart at all. And you'll see in this movie, it's kind of weird about that when Woody has his inner voice. And I think it's the sweetest part of this movie that I don't, I don't understand that whole thing. I love this ignorance. Or not, it's not ignorance. It's with, he's innocent. A better way of saying it, and it's, he's just one of his best friends. And he, you'll see through this thing, that's the journey through this thing is how cool friends these guys are. Um, it, it was your your question was like the responsibility and the, the yeah, tons of responsibility, tons of pressure, a lot of sleepless nights knowing that we we're going to attempt this because we love the end of Toy Story three and. Uh, feel like that's the completion of Woody and Andy's story, but there was more Woody's story to tell us how, come, how we approached it. Well, so this one's not the last one either, is it? Well, we, you know, we, we sort of joked that we were, we, we thought Toy Story 2 was the last one. You know, we, we, we finished that one, we thought that one was the end of the story. And how we approached this was, uh, to echo Josh, the end of Andy's story and Woody's story, but but Woody is the is the protagonist. There was, this was the, the final chapter. And as filmmakers, to be honest, we, we sort of feel like we feel satisfied that this is where you could end it. Now, there's an implied future to all these to all these films, uh, and and we sort of never say never at Pixar. But as storytellers, we're we're satisfied with with this as the as the closing of the chapter. You don't just need a vacation, a nap, and then you'll come back. And Who knows? Yeah. What to I need both of those. Yes. yes, you need both of those. So, can you? How do you get into his character, or uh, let's say, how do you unleash your crybaby side <laughs> after being a uh, baddest John Wick to I mean, crybaby? I, I think that all of the characters, and I think this is what's really cool about um, Disney and Pixar and and Josh, all of the creators of the stories and, and and the characters themselves and the performances, is that there's, I think we can identify there's so many different kinds of people going through different things and. Um, Duke Kaboom just happened to be a crybaby and super with a big heart and brave, um, who loved life and and so I think that there's a bit of Duke Kaboom in all of us. 
buzz. Is there anything memorable, uh, whether emotional or blooper from the sound booth, a session that you remember? Yeah, I, I can't. And that, um, I love kids, kind of. <laughs> I like families. But my comedy for 20 or 30 years is not for children. So sometimes my memorable things is saying stuff that Buzz would generally not say. <laughs> After a long day of doing the same thing over and over again. But the, the classic to me is one I would ad-lib. And they don't, it's not like... Robin, when he did Aladdin, when I ad lib, they it's it's not a happy moment for the animators. <laughs> they go, oh God, that was funny. That was God, darn it, that was funny. <laughs> Which means they got to go back and reanimate. And uh, the, Miss Nesbeth, when I got uh, drunk on Darjeeling tea, and I'm holding my own arm in my hands. I think somebody, I can't remember why I lost my arm. And I said, is the hat too much? Is the hat too much? And it's under my breath as I walk out of that scene. It was hysterical. They left that in, and uh, Woody goes, you are a toy! And I said, you are a sad, strange little man. <laughs> and you have my pity. And that was, again, the animators going, oh, damn, that's funnier than what we wrote. Uh, no. And those moments are great to me, because early on, they give it to me lately. That they don't, they just, Tim, read his written. <laughs> and from day one. And that's why Kano is perfect for the role. You, you know, Yes, that, that, and also when we cast these roles, we don't want to see faces. We don't want to, we have a casting department, and they bring in a bunch of recordings, and so we, we say, turn the headshots over. We don't want to see who the person is. We just want to hear the voice. We don't even know who we're listening to. And so we'll listen to a bunch, and who, who's that, or who's that? But right away, keep, we, I think we grabbed a clip of that from. One of, one, of, one of your movies we, we grabbed and, and we're listening to, and we all went, whoa, who's that? Who's that? Who's that crybaby? <laughs> <laughs> and, and they said, this Keanu Reeves, and we're like, that's perfect. And we're just so grateful that uh, Keanu Reeves... There's a lot of great Canadians that work at Pixar, too, and they all volunteered to animate all of the Duke Kaboom shots. So he's mostly animated by Canadian animators. Almost 100%. I think 100%. 100%. The Maple yeah. Leaf crew. Yeah, the Maple Leaf crew. We hung the flag on the Pixar when we were shot briefing that sequence. So how did you get Gabby going? Great question. <laughs> we realized we'd never done a, a doll before. Just a regular, like, a, a doll. And, uh, you know, we all have daughters, and, and so we look at our own kids and our, their toys and our toys for truths and and I just love the idea of uh, kind of talky Tina slash you know uh, chatty Kathy ish and then also just that she would be like the godfather like <laughs> have minions that to me I was like we've never done that and so that's one of my favorite scenes what, what, what? I can't remember. Did, didn't Lotso's henchman baby she had, he had big baby yeah big, did, babe, did big baby make a noise he made a weird vocalization baby noise I think yeah he was a crybaby. He was a crybaby. Literally. He was. <laughs> Literally. But he had some nice eyes, too. But Christina, I, I, was, I, I may remember this, not entirely accurate, but when we first sat with you and we were talking, we pitched Gabby yeah, a little bit like Norman Desmond or Lost in Time and all this stuff, and uh, we were showing you stuff with the dummies. And did, did I remember what you said? Oh, I, what did you say? I, I thought you guys had done, like, weird background research on me because I actually have a ventriloquist doll in my office, like in, in my house that I wanted my entire life. I, every year I would ask my parents for this Charlie McCarthy ventriloquist doll and they were like, you're weird. You're giving you a baby doll. You're never going to get it. And then as an adult, I finally, I finally got one, but I was like, oh, how did you guys get in my mind? It was so funny because I think we were pitching it saying something like, and of course, you know, these dummies that are awful and that no one would want. You go, no, I, I have one. You know? And we're like, okay. We're like, we love her. That is Gabby Gabby. Boom! <laughs> Do you go like to infinity and beyond, like get into the spirit of ad nauseum? Because I've, I've literally said that when that shows up on a script after 25 years, they say, and you, you see the last line, yeah, I think I got that part. <laughs> Say it again. You know, there's only so many ways. I know, but is that like a fun, like if, yeah. if you have to find the character? Do I, I find myself doing that? this a lot, reaching for the lasers and all that stuff. Yeah, it's, it's just like you, said. <laughs> you know what, I, what? What this is though, and this is why we love this cast so much. They're so effortlessly skilled at this. Uh, um, we look for people at Pixar, and this goes back from t Tim and the original that don't come to it to do a 
cartoon, what people think as actors, like, oh, you just do a voice, or what kind of voice do you want? And we just want the truth, hu human character that they bring to it. And so it's just such an honor to work with, with you guys because we got to see it every time we'd be in the booth, just pure acting. And I mean, we're in a booth at Pixar, there's nothing to look at, we have nothing to show, and yet they can dig down and just breathe life into these characters. And so we're just, I, I just wanted to add on to that because we're just so honored to, to be able to work with them. They breathe so much life into the, the, these films. It's awesome. Thank you. I pitched this and I still say it. I'd love for a, a benefit for one of the children's hospitals to have all of us do the movie, read it. Even half, all of us just to sit in the room together, all of us read this. Like, I think it'd be fabulous to do a cold read on that, you know. Yeah, the strong, powerful female part of that when you took on Gabby Gabby? Um, I'm, I, 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 I think that every woman has that vulnerability and strength within her. And so I sort of approach probably everything I do in a little bit in that way. Um, that's maybe why you guys called me. I don't know. Um, but uh, <laughs> but uh, I just think, like they were saying earlier, all of the characters in this movie are so well-rounded, and that's such a sweet thing about this character, is that she's not just one thing, and, and she has got this strength, even though she's a baby doll. Um, so it was, it was a joy to sort of bring all those sides to her. Um, is there something that you want the little girls to get out of your performance? And, and Anne from Gabby Gabby, what message do you want to send to them? Um, I, I think the, ultimately that you have to listen to everyone's full story before you make a judgment about them and, and to hopefully not make a judgment about them. I think that's the, the lovely thing that she brings to this part of the story is that everyone comes from a place and it's what made them who they are and you need to listen to that before you can fully understand them. To the whole thing. We laughed, we cried, the whole, ran the gamut. Yeah, I, I'm too close to it. I said this is, a, I, you know, through the process, and then I'm always, because I'm old, a filmmaker, and I love the computer-generated part of this. It gets better and better and better. I just like the, just the look of it was stunning. And then, as I've said many times, I I read through it, and then the, the end kind of was mercurial. And then I read it, and it was so it was so bold. And I I wrestle with loss in my family and loss in my life, and I'm an old philosophy major in college, and I just losing this kind of stuff, losing and gaining, it's like the sadness, number uh, four was like a, a daughter getting married perhaps. It's, there's great sadness because she's leaving, but great sadness because she's also gaining something. And that's what this is about. I told Tom the same thing when he hadn't read it and I'd finished it. I had a real tough time. And, but I have a lot of other baggage about losing things and where do you, how, how this whole world is. And I just, I just loved how they felt. The beginning is emotional. And they trick you with this little emotion thing at the beginning. <laughs> so you get sucked into it. And then Kaboom is so funny. These guys, all the, everybody knew is so wonderful to watch. You know, the, the part of me going, well, where did I ever show up to? Is the buzzer or say anything? And it's back to the same beauty of the way these, these monstrously idiotic great writers come up with this story that is so... Thank you. <laughs> it's just wonderful. It's, just, it's great, great writing. No, Tim, did we, we should, I haven't told you this, but we actually used your reaction a little bit as, as inspiration. When we, when we met and recorded and, and walked you through that ending, your reaction was like our first receipt. Because we were, you know, we were, we realized we were throwing the ball pretty far with going to that ending. And we were hesitant, even at Pixar, we were kind of going, can we do this? Okay, should we do this? Should we do it? And when you read it and we were talking to you and we saw you, we saw him kind of recoil back like, Oh man, oh, okay. I, we could tell it hit you. And we thought, oh, if we can get Tim Allen, like our Buzz Lightyear himself, to sort of sit back and, and, and ponder it, maybe we have something there. So that was kind of the, you, you didn't know, but you gave us our first kind of receipt that, that that might be the right story math. What's good to know my pain is that yeah, we, <laughs> you know that you profit off of other people's misery. That's a, that's a pleasant thing. I hesitated to tell it, but I had to. I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> to do your thing and some of the better voiceover people said you gotta live those words it's a very different world the voice over talent world which is kind of strange i'm in this middle world those those people are not excited that actors got into this business 
They were trained as voiceover talents. And they, some of those guys, Paul Fries comes to mind, they rose to a level. I loved that process. So that's the world I come from. When I started acting, to combine those two, I love working with other actors. I, doing voiceovers is all about the director. And they, they bring it out if you try to get it this way, but they, boy, they do honor the process when these guys let you just go and then find who Buzz is. What I will say the last of this is that I've got to a point where I can't believe I'm saying this, where I'll go, Buzz wouldn't say that. <laughs> I mean, I, he has Rapisha. Is the problem. He has, he has pattern baldness. <laughs> that, little, that, that balacala that he wears. It's for fireproofing. No, actually, he's got a beautiful head of hair underneath there. It's rather curly, and he's got a, a man bun. <laughs> nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Hello, everyone. We are back, but with some newer faces this time, some new faces. So, everybody ready? Yes. Toy Story 4, here we go. Producer Mark Nielsen. Woo. Give him a round of applause. Producer Jonas Rivera. Director Josh Cooley. <laughs> Annie Potts, the voice of Bo Peep. All right, how's everybody feeling? You got some questions? You're armed with some good questions? Yes. You were great last time. Okay, how are you guys feeling? And I want to know, this franchise has been such a juggernaut and so successful. Toy Story 3 alone made nearly half a billion dollars at the box office. What kind of pressure is there to do as well or top? Not until now. <laughs> You're welcome. Right, right. I guess I should answer that question. Go for it. Um, well, I will say that when we start off in the story room just thinking of ideas, we ne we're never thinking like, oh, Toy Story 3 made all this money, we've got to do that soon. Like we're, we're just trying to tell a good story, that's all. If we start to think about all the stuff that happens afterwards, I think I'd just, it would just collapse in, on myself. You wouldn't do it. Started just thinking about the, yeah. the box office, right? So, um, but we love these characters. We love the world, and and you know, Pixar is built upon Toy Story, and so we just wanted to tell a great story. And Tony, talk to us a little bit about joining this family that is already so established and so beloved. Yeah, uh, it's um, overwhelming, <laughs> and which helps because Forky is very overwhelmed. Um, but I remember when they brought me up to Pixar, and they kind of described him as, you know, he's kind of nervous, and I was like, check. Uh, yeah, he asks a lot of questions, check. And he's kind of gullible to a fault, and I was like, bingo, I'm in. Um, so I just love that he, you know, sees everything as new, and I, I, I mean, mainly I love that he's a, a character that his home place is trash, that's all he knows, is to help people eat soup. You, you know, uh, a new improved, emboldened, courageous, seasoned um, gal. Uh, it's been lovely. It's when you first read the script for Toy Story 4. Ah, ah, reading the script, that's hilarious. <laughs> uh, the, the, the way this has worked, the very, on the first one, and this was now 25, four years ago, we actually did read a script. It was a screenplay that looked like every other screenplay. You read that and then you saw every every storyboard animatic of the entire story. Uh, the second uh, movie, there was a script, but there was no really, we had, we, had made the, we had made one, we had the understanding of it. We realized there's no real way you can appreciate the weaving uh, of imagery and, and character that Pixar did on, on the paper, so you really did wait to see the sequences put together. Uh, the third one, they didn't, they didn't even bother doing anything other than showing us the movie in animatic form before we began recording. And on this one, I, I never read a complete script. I don't think anybody did. But we read the sequences that we were in and had a continuous running dialogue of, of what was going. These movies are made 
uh, with a great flexibility of it. They work on it. We record it. You give. They start off with with the storyboards and 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 words that you say. Then you record them, and then they go away for six months and refine and alter and change and test what what we have done up to that point. And um, you, so every time we would show up to work, there would be some new iteration of this idea that had been presented to us at the beginning of what all the, what everybody is going through. And the, uh, the, the, what was brand new on this one was that uh, Annie and I got to record together at the same time. And that never happens. You're always in a sound stage by yourself, uh, not being able to move off mic. And we got to actually relate um, with this vast history between the two of us, you know. To have a character in a movie that's not even released yet, that is already a favorite of so many people and has already become so iconic. Oh, well that's really nice to hear. I mean, I'm, I, I mean it when I say that I'm still kind of waking up to this, so even you saying that, I'm like, sorry? So the, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to even uh, digest, um, because this has been such an iconic franchise that I never thought that I would be a part of something, but to, to what Woody, <laughs> just call him Woody, um, but to what Tom was saying is, uh, there's, there was a simplicity to Forky that I just absolutely fell in love with, and the fact that he's, I mean, he's made from pipe cleaners and a spork and little popsicle sticks, and he brings Bonnie so much joy. And he just, he's, he's brought into the world, he doesn't understand the rules of the universe, he's very confused when people drop to the ground, when humans walk in, you know, he's just, he's just kind of always wide-eyed, and he's very present, and I just, I loved the simplicity of it, and it was, it's been a huge honor to, to voice him. But I will say, we are so grateful to be here and to be these voices, but we are such a small piece of the pie of what is involved in Toy Story. The amount of artistry and creatives and tremendous labor that has gone into this movie outside of us, I mean, that I, I, the attention needs to be shined on that because they really have worked so hard and it's just, the movie is eye candy. It's just such a visual masterpiece, it really is. If I was just to sum it up in one word, it's transition, so every, character in this movie has gone through a transition or is struggling with going through one or has not gone through one. So Bo Peep has gone through a transition that we learn about while working on the movie. Uh, Woody is struggling with moving from Andy's room to Bonnie's room. Uh, Forky doesn't even want to transition at all. <laughs> and, right. Right. And, and Gabby, Gabby is kind of stuck in time. That's why part of the reason we put it in an antique store is like things are not changing around her. She's covered in there's dust everywhere. And uh, even Duke is haunted by, you know, his past as well. So um, that's how we approached it when we were working on it. Just kind of thinking that all these characters are kind of having the same theme that way. There, I, 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 it's not just because we have made this, these movies for the last 25 years, but I, I think that we all sort of know how commerce works right now. And there is, there is this protocol that says you have a movie coming out, so therefore, you build a land, or you you know put a game on it, and whether the movie is decent or not, you 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 have to you have to put up. You can't escape it, no matter how much you want it, you know. But there is there has been this interesting thing about Toy Story is that it exists sort of by audience demand, by way of audience need. Um, if the second movie hadn't worked out or it had petered out somehow, I, I think we would have lost the confidence of, of everybody who has watched it. So all of these movies exist because they were willed into existence by the audience who was willing to invest it and return right where they were, and by the, the, the people at Pixar who did not take uh, their responsibilities lightly when it comes down to, to Toy Story. They, they have to be able to reach a level of... Uh, um, uh, gravitas or import or connection and that land over there is the example of it as well I mean they could have banged one of those things out pretty quickly you know and it would still be up but this is now a thing because uh, there's not just they're not just iconographic images they're actually emotional beats that people carry 
carry with them. And it's only because these movies have been so important. I, 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 I'm on our fifth or sixth generation now. How long does your generation last? Three and a half years? I don't know. <laughs> but you know, you know when, the next one, when the next one comes into consciousness, there's now, it, it's almost as though they were just now going to build a, a um, you know, a 20,000 leagues under the sea or, right. or something like that. Because it, it, you could view it as being late, but because it has, has garnered this kind of like attention and the attention of you all, um, that it like, it's kind of like fitting in proper that it exists now. You know, it, it also makes so much sense to me that Woody is, is in front at, at the park because he, your voice, him, he is so welcoming and so like, He's he's every he's the father that you just like just guiding you through life, and there's just such a warmth that Tom has created in these creators. He's the guy. I think I have said these three words more on the Toy Story movies than I've said anywhere else in my life, and it is it, it has always been. Come on, guys! <laughs> I've said come on, guys, eight billion times in some you know some iteration of all the Toy Stories. <laughs> Oh, I, I, I don't know. I'm so happy with what I play. I, I never have thought about that. Um, it's like asking who you, else you would like to be in life. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I'd bring Beaker from The Muppet Show into the universe. Because <laughs> he's my fave. <laughs> Because I just go to the theater and scream back at the projection. Right? <laughs> you <need> that talk. <laughs> we, were, we were all there, and when we ended up recording the very last line, um, I had to. I had to come to a. It was. There was a realization where it was like, oh, I, I. With, is that the last line? And they all said, yeah. that's it. And it was, uh, we were back in the original, we were in studio. Stage B. Stage yeah, B. yeah. Stage B. Stage B. Doc, it. who is the, the mixer, was through the glass, and that's where it all began, and that's where it was all ending. Um, earlier, uh, the, 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 sec the, the sessions before that, Tim had texted me, and with his in that kind of way, hey, uh, hold on, hold on to yourself. These lights, you're not gonna believe it. <laughs> still, 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 still recover. <laughs> um, uh, and so, knowing that we were going to be in this territory, I, I asked if it was okay. Usually, you are, you have the mic stand and the mic, the stand and the mic, and they're all at a table in front of you. And I asked if we could turn it around so my back was to them because I, I, I didn't want to have any self-consciousness for what I knew was going to be the last, you know, the, certainly the last few hours I'm going to be spending on the movie, but also recording the, the last scenes. Uh, and when it came to pass, it was, I felt as though I was on the other side of a river waving to everybody that uh, I had left back in the old country. It was, it was pretty profound. It was a, you know, there's so much muscle memory that goes into it. You drive into the lot through the same Gate. You park in the same spot they had for you. you. Then you go through the same doors and you get in your car and you drive back through and you think, I, I have, I've, I've recorded the last moment of the current Toy Story. And we have um, these um, talking points that we've been given in regards to talking about whatever future <laughs> may come to pass. Just give me a second, I'll give you the official rendition of what I'm supposed to say in regards to a possible other Toy Story. Let me see if my I think you just said a lot of stuff you weren't supposed to. I think I just did. Pretty sure about that. Um, well, um, if there, the, I, I know where we leave off. Uh, the, uh, Toy Story 4 is about Woody's journey into the world outside the comfort of Bonnie's playroom and all the possibility that holds for a toy. So just take that and uh, extrapolate it as far as you want to, and we'll see what goes on. And thank you, Disney Vertical Integration Department, so that I'm aware of what I'm supposed to say here. So I just wondered, 
no pressure. Um, I just wondered what it's like to step back in Woody's cowboy boots after it's been a quarter of a century that you've been Woody. Is it possible to put into words what Woody means to you? Uh, Woody has been the great gift um, that I've seen play out again and again in my own family as, as well as uh, sort of around the world, even, even in uh, cultures that it's not my voice, you know, in Spanish or, you know, Mandarin or what have you. Uh, Woody still is this three-dimensional uh, emotional bag that kids carry around with them. What I have truly appreciated is that no matter how old you are now, you are all, when you see one of the movies, you're the same age you were when you saw the first one. And it, 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 it's, there's not a bump, there's not a jolt, there's no nostalgia, nothing ages poorly. It's exactly as it was and sort of always will be. And I think in some ways, it's like the definitive Disney enterprise is that there is a cohesiveness and an, and, and an eternal quality to not just the stories and the characters, but the emotional bonds that we all have with, with, with each one of them. And I have always been dazzled when they have come back and said, we're going to try another one. Because the question always is, oh, really? Really? Well, ain't you guys bold? You think you think you can match that last one we did? Well, good luck. And uh, then they say, well, as soon as they start talking about Gabby Gabby or Duke Kaboom or the true catalyst of Toy Story 4, so much that it's called Toy Story Forky, Tony Hale is uh, Tony Hale is uh, Forky. Because look at that. Look, look what he is. He is. A bunch of stuff that has been empowered by the imagination of, of his creator. And that is the essential, that, that's what being a toy is. It's what, that's the great power of what a toy has. So they did it. These, uh, these crackpot geniuses up there at Pixar, the 900 or so of them that operate in their darkened rooms and <laughs> eat takeout food for months at a time. <laughs> the whole challenge in this one was at the antique store because there's 10,000 items in there antique store that all had to be built and shaded and, and and set dressed and everything and we didn't even know if our computers could actually render that there's so much stuff so early on we did some some, some tests and uh, it turned out pretty good and we're like okay we can we can actually do this so that was the, and then we needed to just make more stuff to go into that antique store so a lot of it was made for this film there's a lot of Easter eggs in this movie because we just got lazy. And so you can find, I, I swear, if you pause any frame when they're in the story, you'll see something in the background. From yeah, from every movie Pixar's ever done, there's something in the antique store. Wow. Wow. Come on. How about that now? So we didn't even know. The sets wow. department, I just noticed the other day, Carl and Ellie's house shrunk down on a shelf. You know, from up. And Big Bong's rocket is Big in the background. <laughs> Isn't that just a little more tough? Oh, Woody. <laughs> that was sweet to play that out. And, uh, I mean, as we said earlier, you know, I, I never saw the full script. I never knew exactly what I was doing. I, be, I Over time, I became aware how um, important the, the role was going to be, but not until three weeks ago when I saw the thing, I, I told Josh after. Thank you so much for putting this crown on my head. Um, I think she's so lovely. And I hope that I, you know, my wish was to bring all the experience of my, my uh, long, uh, colorful life to, to kick-ass Bo. <laughs> um, I just want to know, do you think Woody and Bo people will get married? Because you're the cutest couple. <laughs> Well, <laughs> wait, this could be talking points. Well, <laughs> I will say that they have, Woody has known since 1994 that Bo was the figurine for him. <laughs> he just always, he just always knew it. And let me check these talking points. <laughs> <laughs> They're getting harder and harder to there find. Um, <laughs> Toy Story 4 reunites Woody and his long lost friend, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
has become an adventure-seeking free spirit. They discover that they are worlds, worlds apart when it comes to life as a toy, and yet they know that fate is an odd thing, and there is no substitution for love in this crazy, kooky, confusing world. It's all right. It's all right. Here. Let's okay. give a collective aww. aww. Thank you guys. That's all I'm looking for. Thank you.